The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? We can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxing. All right, we have Nat Young, the pride of Santa Cruz, back on the Elite Championship Tour in 2022, and our very honored guest on our first episode back for 2022. Nat, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been it's been a long year last year, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting 2022 started, and uh, super excited to be obviously back on tour and surf some good waves, and yeah. Good man. And, and it sounds like you're still in Santa Cruz, haven't left for Hawaii yet, but you know, how, how have things been in prep mode for the start of the season? Who have you been hanging with? Have you been surfing a lot? What, what's been going on? Um, yeah, I'm still in Santa Cruz and I leave on this coming Thursday to go out to Hawaii. Um, it's been like a pretty short off season just cause Hawaii wrapped up, uh, like at the start of December and it's the start of January right now. So between Christmas holidays and um, everything else, uh, it's been a lot going on and um, trying to just wrap some stuff up here in Santa Cruz before taking off to Hawaii and just kind of locking in on surfing and competition and all that. Makes sense. I mean, when we were talking about setting the the time up for the podcast, we were kind of saying, oh, you know, it was an interesting break. We had a lot of rain. You know, down where I'm at, there are kind of terrible conditions for a chunk of it. But every time I hopped onto Instagram, I saw you hammering like fun little waves, like nooks and crannies up by you. And I'm like, oh, man, are you getting waves up there or is this a smoke bomb situation? What was going on? Did you guys get little waves over the break, even though it was holidays and kind of chaotic? Could have been a little bit of both there. A couple <laughs> smoke bombs, maybe. No, but um, it's been a pretty bad winter. Like, I think this is probably the worst winter I can remember. It's been really cold up here uh the water's freezing the air is cold and the waves have been pretty average um i don't know how it's been down there it looks like i would assume it's probably been a bit smaller down there than even up here but yeah it, we it hasn't it's been pretty bad um the last week actually today was pretty fun <laughs> but but it's funny you know it's like one of those things where i'm up in ventura county and then our office is in los angeles so a bunch of our coworkers live and surf down there and you know, anytime it's like terrible all over the state for some reason, like El Porto and Santa Monica, like those waves are good. So I've been seeing like Travis Logie post where it's like double overhead and I'm like, what the, yeah. what the hell's going on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been crazy. It's been like a lot of wet weather and a, and a bit of rain and just like here in Santa Cruz, you can like, if you want to find fun waves, you can like work for it and drive like an hour or an hour and a half. And like, you can get fun waves pretty much every day. It's just like how much time do you want to spend driving and and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it, I don't know. It's been been tough for sure. And and I believe you know, he checked me if I'm wrong, but this was your first holiday with your baby girl, Rocky Rose. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. This was our first Christmas with her, so it was exciting. Um, she's really young still. She's only she was nine months during Christmas, so. I uh, wasn't too sure what was going on yet, but um, it was fun and uh, we had a good time. So, yeah, it was exciting. Different. Is it different for you? I, I'm, I'm presuming, but I don't I don't want to say with any certainty, but is it different for you managing your surfing time now that you're father? You know, as you pointed out, it's like if you really want to work for it and hunt waves down and work on tides and winds and swell directions, you can probably find the thing. But you know, having a, a little person that is your responsibility now that for me anyway, that changed things pretty radically. Totally. For sure. It's, it's a, a right after she was born, it was, it took some time to kind of like figure out how, like, how am I going to find some, find my time to surf, like, you know, figure out a schedule, kind of get on like some type of routine took a while. <laughs> and obviously like before that, my life was like based around just like waking up, and surf like dedicating the whole day to like finding the best waves I can find and surfing for as long as I want. And, um, so it's been different for sure. And, and, uh, the nights still are pretty rough right now. 
mm-hmm. not much sleep. There's been so many times I like set my alarm for like 5.30 or 6 and like I'm going to get up and go surf early or go train and, you know, three wake ups throughout the night and then that alarm <laughs> goes off. You're just like, uh, I don't know if I can do it. So <laughs> yeah, we it's, had, it's tricky. We had, well, we had the twins and they never slept at the same time for like the first five months and twins is i can't imagine that that's crazy it's funny and then i meet people who have like triplets and i'm like i don't i have no idea like you're outnumbered like <laughs> it's like but i found i don't know if you found the same thing but having less time like and we're not at the same level obviously but whatever i was doing that was away from the kids i was so much more focused have you found that like surfing wise even though you haven't had like the entire day to like hunt down a session do you find that your sessions are, are maybe as, if not more productive, just because you're like, I'm, I'm here, I'm here for two hours, I'm here for whatever time, I'm going to make the most of it, and then I'm going to get back to, to Rocky Rose? Totally. Yeah, I feel like you're maximizing those little short, those windows that you have, you know, like, you're not like, wasting time, like, oh, is it good enough? Or should I go try to find somewhere else that looks better? It's just kind of like, here's my two hours, like, I'm out there, I'm going to go surf. Um, and then move on to whatever it that you know the the rest of the day has. But I mean, fair enough. I've had plenty. Of, I've found plenty of time to surf. Um, no complaining there at all. Mm. It's just been a little bit of um, just just trying to find the like balance of like surfing and some you know family time, and then everything else that that needs to be done too. So um, yeah, I was starting to get the hang of it. Makes sense. So we, we, we touched on it very briefly, but in a few weeks' time, you were going to be putting on a competition singlet at the Billabong Pro Pipeline as a returning member to the Elite Championship Tour. You must be feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, I'm super excited for sure. I mean, get it, the thought of getting to surf pipe, I haven't surfed pipe in probably like, I don't know, it's probably been three, three years maybe since I've surfed out there. So... Uh, the thought of getting barreled again in a contest is, is exciting and something I'm definitely looking forward to. And, uh, being back on the CT was, is obviously like where I've wanted to be and a dream of mine. And, um, it's very exciting to be back there and to be able to compete with those guys and get to surf those, you know, world-class waves that, that are on the CT. Now we're going to wind the clock all the way back here in the second segment, but but speaking to this Herculean effort of requalifying after being cast back into the wilderness, you know, I believe you qualified for the CT for the first time in 2020, 2013, excuse me. You get a second at Bells, you get a second at Portugal, you finish eighth overall, you win the Rookie of the Year honors. I think you're on pretty good sponsorship contracts at the time. I think you were at Hurley when you were on tour, fresh off the Nike transition, you know, CI surfboards, et cetera. Four years on the championship tour. So much has changed for you both personally and professionally since that first window on the CT. My guess is that it was wildly different qualifying through the last year compared to when you did it back in 2012. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean... It took a, it, it was a long process for me to get back to where, to, to making the CT and it sounds, you know, it sounds fairly simple, just like you fall off and some guys like requalify, you know, it's just like, I don't know, for me, it was, it was a lot. Um, it was obviously, it was pretty hard for me to like accept kind of what had happened and along with everything else I was going through in my life, it just like. I don't know. It was super hard for me. Um, Mm. it was obviously a mental thing and just like a mental hurdle that I needed to get past. And it was just like, I don't know. I just felt like I was like trying so hard to like get back there that it was like, just almost seemed like it was like working against me in a way. Mm. And it was like only till I like, kind of like let go a little bit, did things kind of start falling into my favor and uh, now I find myself back on CT. So yeah, obviously it's totally different. It feels like a different life now. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. And I mean, such a different world too. I, I mean, I had the good fortune of, of seeing you come up through the pro junior ranks and the QS and just 
being the superstar from Santa Cruz and all this in industry investment in, in your generation, you know, and you were like a leader in that as well. And the surf industry has changed so much. You know, we, you've touched on how things in your personal life have changed so much. You know, the world's gone through a, a pandemic, is, is still going through a pandemic. And even the structure of how to qualify has changed. And there's just, it. I'm sure it's just been radically destabilizing, you know, when you compare your 2012 qualification campaign to 2021. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's so much different now just with obviously with what we've dealt with the last couple of years and, and the uncertainty of the tour and kind of that the one year that the tour, you know, kind of ended in March, the QS, and then, you know, that long layoff and then kind of picking back up, but like also carrying on with that like half, like shortened year that it had happened. Um, I had a decent, like that, those first uh, few events of that year that they stopped on, I had a couple good events. So I, ha I felt like I was on a bit of a, a roll and then, you know, things stopped and kind of it was almost like you, your life went on and you surfing was kind of took a little backseat for a bit there and then picked it back up last year or yeah, last year. And just the way that those two years like meshed together was, was a lot, you know, it was like between like two, three years. So, yeah. um, it was a strange year last year, but, uh, I know everyone was pretty excited just to be traveling and, and doing what we like to do. So yeah, it was fun. You mentioned having to overcome, you know, a hurdle that I think you mentioned was like a mental hurdle for you. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And and was there anything specifically that you did? Did you did you work with you know sports psychologist or even just a therapist? Or was there anything that clicked for you in navigating that hurdle? And do you feel like you're do you feel like you're past that? I guess is my question. Um, like it's so hard to like pinpoint, you know, why it was so hard for me. Um, I think the year I fell off tour, it just seemed like a lot of, I had a lot of heats that flipped and didn't go my way with like in the last minute. Oh, I feel, I feel like it happened a few times. Like just like, I felt like things were working against me and obviously you never want to be in that mind frame that anything's, you know, working against you, but it just felt that way. And I don't know. I just feel like I, I like it. Like when I fell off tour, it just like my like world shattered basically. Um, you know, it was like, I was having some success on tour the few years I was on tour. I felt like there was like falling off tour never really even like crossed my mind based off like how my first few years on tour went. Like that was never even like a thought. And then you know, to find myself in that like tough situation towards the back end of the year, having to deal with that pressure, that pressure is gnarly. Like dealing with that was, you know, like you barely sleep at night when you're like on the bubble there. Cause it's like your, your whole life, it's your career. It's like everything you've worked towards. So I definitely stressed myself out a bunch with that. And then, um, after falling off tour, I just like, I think I tried to like control too much and like try to force too much like I changed up like the way I like trained and the way I like ate and the way I you know like I overthought everything I like overthought like oh, if I eat this piece of bread like am I gonna make my heat or like you know like I almost like I just went down this like downward spiral you kind of do everything like based off like performing well and like you know like what is this gonna help me perform at my best and so like I went down this like weird like rabbit hole of like overthinking everything I did and then it just I don't know I was just in my head I, I and so I don't know it took a while to get past that and it wasn't like one thing that I did that I think like got me past that I think it was just like a combination of like those few years of like little things that kind of put me into a place where I I just obviously mentally I'm in a much better place than I was and um, you know, meditations helped a lot just to try to like let go of, of, of all the storylines and the past and just kind of like be okay with like what's happening at the moment, kind of just take what's coming. And, um, you know, it's, it's just crazy. Surfing's like, we've all been doing it for so long and we all know how to like, we all know what to do. It's just like, 
going out there in your heats and like getting out of your own way and like it's like so basic but like sometimes it's like it can be so hard I, I mean, we talk about this on the podcast quite a lot, you know, and it's one of those things where there's so many uncertain variables in surfing, especially as a sport compared to everything else, right? Because the field of play is maybe the most dynamic field of play in all of sports, right? So if you're sure. a basketball player, you can say, I have these physical gifts, I have all this talent. I know if I work hard and as you pointed out, if I eat right and I do this and my and my team is this, then you can walk onto the court with quite a lot of swagger because you yeah. know, like it's the court's the same size, the the rim's still 10 feet above the ground. I know I'm the, the biggest beast on the court. I'm going to win. And you can do all that exact same stuff in surfing and then paddle out in your heat in the ocean and the ocean's like, nope. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And it's, I, I do think that's why the ceiling for swagger in competitive surfing is so low because even the very best guys are like, I don't know, like we'll see what happens when we get out there. For sure. Yeah. Any day can go anybody's way, but like clearly like the top guys, like they like Gabriel's and John John's like, Mm. you know, their percentages of making heats, even when it doesn't go their way is, is so high. Like, you know, that's hard to do. Like, you know, they're making heats even when they're not catching the best waves. And so like, just, uh, I mean, it's just, it's different, but yeah, so the, the variables in surfing and like, you know, you feel as prepared as you could possibly be and you go out there and you don't catch the right wave. It can be like, it can just be so like draining, can drain you like emotionally. Well, and we, we talk about that a lot too, right? Because there's, there's levels in the sense of like, just getting to the CT is not the last level, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, now I want to get into the teens and now I want to get into the top five. Now I want to contend for a title. And as you were talking about, you know, you had so much success early on that your brain is probably programmed to thinking like, yeah, I'm, I mean, this year I'm in the title hunt. Right. And then at the end of the year, as you pointed out, it's like, oh my God, I might not requalify. Like I was not psychologically prepared for this. I was, I'm supposed to be in the title hunt. What am I doing here? Um, and it's, it, sometimes it's just a, a, a matter of a few heats or a few waves that could be the difference between that. For sure. And it's just like, I think, I mean, I look at some of the guys, like for instance, like Mick for me is like, I would, when I was having, I admired so much about him was that he'd have like a bad event you know, like wouldn't go his way, he'd lose. And he would like be able to just like wash that off. And the next event, he'd come back and like win it or something like that. And like, that was always something that I have. I still try to work on is just like not dwelling over like the past. And like, you put so much effort and energy into like preparing for one of these contests and then like to paddle out there and, and, you know, not get an opportunity or not get like a quality wave or something like that. It just like, Sometimes I like, you know, think like, oh, if I didn't do this or make this little paddle for the first wave, like I could have made that heat. And so just, just not, not like thinking back, just kind of like staying focused on what's ahead of you and what's going on in the present is, is something that I've tried to work on because I think that's, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's interesting too, when you're talking about, you know, when you fell off tour and, and the, the feeling like you needed to control everything and it's almost like a version of obsessive compulsive disorder right where you're like i can't have that pizza like i can't have that beer you know and it's like you you end up you end up sort of paring your life down to this sort of monk-like status because you're like anything that i do that isn't on this path might be the difference for me in a heat which isn't necessarily true but that's kind of how your anyone's brain can move into that space while you said it, it wasn't any single thing that helped you through that, I, I'm sure you had family and friends around that did. You know, I, you, you, you lovely partner Tia. Um, I, she, she's been with you for for quite a long time. I'd imagine that she was with you through this time as well. You know, um, your mom, who who sadly passed away last year, would have been with you during this time as well. Were they actively kind of supporting you get through this at the time? I mean, yeah, I like, they always supported me and obviously this is what I love to do. And they always had, you know, full support with me doing this. And they were the first ones to tell me like, you don't look like, 
like they'd watch my heats, you know, and they'd be like, you don't look like you have any confidence at all. Like you're out there, you like, you don't look like you're confident in any of the decisions you're making. Like, it's just like clear as day that you have like no confidence. And so it's like, well, how do you regain that confidence? Cause when I first came on tour, like I would just, it was like, I, I was very confident that I would make through most of the heats I paddled out into. If not, you know, I thought I had a good shot of making every heat. Like, why, but why do you think that was when you were younger? I'm just, I just want to pause you there because I, I, I had the benefit of watching you kick ass, you know, those first few years on tour. And I, I agree. Like, it, and it wasn't just you who thought you were going to get through those heats. Everyone watched those heats and was like, he's super strong. There's no, there's no flaws in his approach. He's going to win this heat. Um, and I would say that you're surfing better now than you ever have, but it, is it, it's psychological, right? Like, and, yeah. and maybe, maybe it's something that comes with age, you know, stress and anxiety starts to creep in and you're, you're more self-aware of like, I don't know, you know, and you start having doubts, but I'm curious if you've thought about that because you were very confident in a, in a non-offensive way back when you were a rookie. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not exactly sure I, I don't know. That's a great question. Probably a psychologist or something could answer that question better than me, but I was confident. I just, I was always confident because I felt like I worked hard and, um, you know, I put a lot of effort into this, a lot of effort into surfing. I felt like I was one of the hardest workers and I, I drew a lot of confidence from that. Um, coming on tour, it was obviously like nothing to lose and everything to prove, you know, it was just kind of right. like, I get a shot to like surf against the best surfers in the world. Um, and I mean, I think the CT, like, like Santa Cruz, there's a lot of good waves up here. And the, I felt like when I made the CT, like my surfing suited the CT better than it suited the QS. Mm. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm very like, good tactically in four man heats. Like, I don't know if I have that like, uh, aggression to like battle guys for waves and stuff. So I don't know. It got a little simpler for me. Once I got on tour, the man on man heats, I feel like a little less luck is involved with that. Like you're both catching good waves and like it comes down to more to surfing in my opinion. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't answer that question. <laughs> Going into the Michelob Ultra Pure Gold Holly of a Challenger event, it's a big title name, um, you were ranked fifth on the Challenger Series. How did you prepare for that event? You know, um, you were in a good position. You didn't get the result you probably wanted at Holly Eva, and I imagine that created more pressure and anxiety for you. What would have happened if you if if things didn't if the ball didn't bounce your way at Holly Eva and you didn't make the tour? Would would you have been back on the Challenger Series this year? Or would you have been thinking of doing something different? Um, honestly, like that contest, I didn't feel like too anxious, or I wasn't honestly even wasn't too anxious after it ended. I was like kind of accepting of like felt like I had a slow heat and I didn't get to surf and you know, my strategy could have worked out and I could have been stoked, but it didn't. And, um, I mean, I would have, if I didn't qualify for the CT, is that your question? Like, what would I be doing? Yeah. Would you be, would that's you, a good question. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I definitely didn't want to accept that that was an option. I was kind of hoping that that wasn't, um, but I mean, I don't know how long can you do the QS for like, especially having a baby and, um, Babies love the QS. <laughs> yeah, you get to bear, bear, you get to zoom zoom them at, like every every <laughs> yeah, day instead weird. of see them. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I feel like I probably would have, but I don't know. It, it, it the reason why is because like I had the after COVID, like all that time off. It was like I started to like really miss what I what I was doing, and like I realized like how much I love like what we get to do like the preparation and the traveling and the competing it's like when you were home when i was home for that long that's the, the longest i've been home in like since i was like 12 right so i was like i was just so excited to be able to like get back to like normal life for me especially with like everything that had happened in my life over the last couple of years yeah 
it was just like, it felt like my life was like somewhat becoming normal. And so, you know, based off of a half a year, like, I don't know if I would have thrown in the towel. Right. That makes sense. And a- yeah. after the, your slow heat, that didn't, didn't bounce your way. Were you watching all the heats like a hawk or were you just like, look, whatever happens, happens. And then do you remember when and where you were when you received the information that you qualified? Um, I wasn't watching all the heats like a hawk. Like, uh, I felt pretty confident, like with where I was at, that like a, a miracle would have to happen for me to not have qualified. So I wasn't like obsessing over it. I mean, I was paying attention. Everyone, anyone that, that tells you they don't pay attention or don't know where they're at or don't know what what how many points they you know how many heats they need to make, they're lying. Yeah, but um, <laughs> it's like the, it's obs- like the same lie when like people are on the CT and they're like, I'm not really that competitive. It's like, nah, I think you are. Like you don't get the yeah. QS without that. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. You hear the guys say like, oh, I don't know, like where I'm, I don't know what I need to do. It's like I think everyone kind of knows what they need to do, but. <laughs> Um, Travis gave me a call. I was like actually getting ready to go for a surf and he congratulated me. So, um, yeah, it was nice to receive that call and it's not like a relief. It doesn't feel like a relief or anything. It just feels like I'm, I'm excited to be, you know, back doing what I once was doing. And, um, yeah. And and as you pointed out too, you know, the rhythm of the seasons change too, right? Holly Eva finishes in early December, I think. And the season starts at the end of January. It's not like you've got three or four months to kind of digest and get ready for Australia. Like you're like, we're going back to Hawaii and it's on. Um, yeah. So it's almost like, well, cool. Like we can, we can go out and have a beer tonight, but like we're training tomorrow morning, almost kind of mentality for a lot of them. Yeah, for sure. There's like, you're not taking your foot off the gas. Like that's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, so I was like, come home and, you know, enjoy the holidays and get some stuff done around here before like leaving for, you know, it's a long time on the road coming up here. So try to take care of some stuff at home that needs to be done before focusing completely on these contests. Makes sense. Well, we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. I think I opened the episode by saying you're Santa Cruz's favorite son. That has to be true because when I think of Santa Cruz surfing, it's, it's a community that has so many amazing surfers and, and people have made a huge impact on surfing and still do to this day. But in terms of championship tour surfers, I want to say the last person to qualify before you did the first time was, Adam Replogle. Is that right? So, yeah, Adam and Chris Gallagher both yep. uh, qualified for the CT. Um, but, yeah, surfing, I mean, Santa Cruz has a very rich surfing background. And um, with the whole big wave movement that went down here and, you know, just growing up here, it was just like there was so many professional surfers and all these guys between like Flea and Barney and Ratboy and Pete Mel and making these movies and, you know, charging big waves and and then Adam and Chris on the CT at, you know, I was, I was lucky to grow up in a town like this and, and basically get to see those guys. And, um, were you born and raised in Santa Cruz? Yeah. I'm born and raised here. East side, West side. We have to, I'm from the West side. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, and is that for, for our listeners that might not be privy to that is, is, the east side, west side, more harmonious in 2021 than it was maybe when you were younger. Because um, you know, if you if you listen to sort of people from back in the day, it was it was pretty aggressive if you were from one side or the other. For sure, yeah. Santa Cruz definitely has that reputation for localism, and there was obviously like some tension between the east side and west side back back before I was born. Probably it, it was a bit rougher than it is than it was when I growing up. And now it's, you know, it's a lot different than, than back then. I'm sure the older guys probably, you know, kind of trip out on the difference of what it is now compared to what it was. <laughs> the, the, it was very territorial and, and now it's, um, it's pretty rad. It's just a more community feeling and, um, yeah, it's changed for the better for sure. 
And what, what was the family like? You know, mom, dad, brothers, sisters. What, what was it like for you growing up? What, what was your family scene like? Um, my mom and dad split up when I was young. And um, I mostly lived with my mom. And, and that's kind of how I started surfing. And she started, she dedicated basically like her entire life to me first she de dedicated her whole life to me doing what I wanted to do. And then that became surfing and growing up in Santa Cruz, you're, you're a bit removed from Southern California and the, the surf industry and the, the contest for when you're a junior and, and all that. So it was, she basically like her whole life was spent taking me to contests down in San Diego or orange County and driving me home, making sure I got back to school uh, every weekend it was that it was, I don't know. I think she went through like two cars basically, uh, taking me to my surf contest. So, um, obviously I wouldn't be any here, or had the career I've had if, if it wasn't for her. So I'm obviously very thankful for everything she did and the dedication that she showed. And how did you get into surf competition? Because I, I think this is interesting for you set against the community of, of Santa Cruz. Cause as I said, and as you highlighted, like there are world-class waves in Santa Cruz and there are world-class surfers in Santa Cruz, but it doesn't produce like an outsized number of championship tour surfers, you know? Right. Um, so, so what, how, how did you get into surf competition? And, and I guess, when did you realize like, Oh, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. Was there an event where you're like, Oh, I won. It's great. Or, or was it just something <laughs> where you were always good at it and you went, Oh, this is, yeah, this is what I should be doing. Um, I think I'm just very, uh, competitive and I think it was like only a matter of time until I figured out what sport I wanted to do that I would, you know, try to compete with, or I, I don't know, just that competitive nature just drove me to surf all day long every day and to try to improve and, and then the competition aspect of, uh, came in and. Um, I don't know. It was like stepping stones for sure of like starting out in Santa Cruz and doing little local contests and then having some success there and making the drives down South to try to compete against at the time that that's where all the best kids were. So, uh, you know, making the drive down there to compete against them. And it's just that competitive nature. I think that probably everyone on the CT and on the QS has is just, that's what drives them to, you know, improve and wake up every day trying to improve and um so yeah that's i think that's why that you know i got to where i've gotten to what other sports were you were you testing the fences on you know well i play like soccer and baseball and basketball growing up so i skateboarded were you good were, were any of those like oh, maybe i should be doing this instead of <laughs> i mean i was pretty young so like i'm not sure how good you really are but i was <laughs> definitely very competitive with all of them. Um, can't imagine I was very good, but, uh, yeah, I, I like doing all of them and surfing was definitely the one I fell in love with the most though. Just, I enjoyed being in the water so much that it was, it was easy. Yeah. And I mean, I, it, it's, I, I love Santa Cruz so much. When I started with the ASP, it would have been late Oh five. And, going up and doing the cold water um, every October when it was a QS event was like highlight of the year. Um, and it yeah. was so fun to go there. And we always got like amazing weather and nice waves. But I remember you when you were really, really young and just everyone was just in awe. It, it felt like the community, and maybe you were it, maybe you were, the, you were part of the sort of the, the, generation of harmony between the East side and the West side. Cause it seemed everyone was supportive of you in these events. And, and I remember you doing the pro juniors, it was the Oakley pro juniors. And then I want to say, you're going to have to heat check me on this. I think it was 2008. Like, didn't you, you won the cold water when you were 17. Did you, and maybe I don't know what year it was, but did, but did you win the pro junior the same day? Was that like, am I no, too, no. Okay. No, all right. All right. No. For some reason that was in my brain. Forget that. That's amazing <laughs> to win that event at, at that age. And and to put your name alongside all the other people that have won it, um, you know, your Jordy Smiths and, and, and whatnot, but also all the locals, you know, Peter Mel and Kieran Horn and those folks, like 
you must have been over the moon at 17. For sure. I, I couldn't, I mean, I, that was like a bit of a shock for sure. It was like, I had just finished MSSAs and that's a contest. Like I had been watching since before I ever started surfing. It was like, you know, the cold water classic would come to Santa Cruz and everyone throughout the whole town was excited to go down and watch all the pro surfers. And, um, it used to be a big contest. So like we were getting the best surfers in the world here. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean, even just like the first year I got to compete in that, I remember it was very special for me. And then to win it, I think I shocked myself for sure. I probably didn't know what happened, but, um, those were, that was fun. And, and that contest was rad. And it's unfortunate that it's, that it's not, it hasn't happened in so long, but, um, I do love those times that everyone got to come up here and I really enjoyed having, you know, just the guys I grew up surfing with and traveling with to come to my home and get to surf the fun ways around here. It's, it, I always have fun when, when they come up here. Now, did you have a pack of sort of similarly aged surfers in Santa Cruz when you were coming up that you guys were pushing each other? Because you obviously ultimately emerged as the clear front runner, but uh, I'm wondering if there were just, if there was a little pack of you guys and girls maybe at the time that, that were, yeah. were all pushing each other competitively. For sure. Like I have some good friends that I've played sports with. Uh, Sean Burns was one of my best friends growing up and we were kind of, you know, we're very competitive with each other and we kind of got into surfing at the same time. And, um, you know, it was friendly competition. And, and so, yeah, those guys, we we're all pushing each other. And then when I started traveling and coming down South and hanging out with Kolohe and Ian Crane and Michael Dunphy and all those guys that I met through NSSAs. Um, so it's always been friendly competition between all of us and we're all good friends. So I think that, you know, that's, that always helps. I think one of the things that stood out when I'd go up there and watch you surf was, um, your board was plastered with sponsorship stickers. <laughs> like I want to say like you're riding those awesome airbrushed stretch ride L boards, maybe quads, like kind of when they were in vogue. Yeah, maybe. And I was like, Oh Jesus, fucking awesome. Um, but like, I think you're riding for O'Neill Oakley, but like the entire board was just caked with stickers. And I, do you remember when you first got properly sponsored by people and, yeah. and what that felt like? Yeah. It's so funny when you're like a little kid, like all you want to do is put, a sticker on your board, you know? And so like, I just, yeah, I remember like the day, I, I don't know how it all, my mom used to like send out a resume or something like that to these companies and you know, they send back a couple of stickers, maybe some t-shirts and, and I was just like over the moon just to like get as many stickers on my board as possible. Um, yeah, yeah it, it was, it's funny. It's when you're a kid, I mean, yeah, all of it was classic. Just putting, couldn't wait to put stickers on my boards and, that was so much fun. But at, at some point, I imagine that turns into like real revenue, right? And and probably pretty big contracts. Do, do you remember, were you ever really that involved in that part of the business? Did you have a manager? Did, did your mom do that? And um, when they started to happen, I'd imagine, it, were you sort of supporting the family? Um, I don't really remember. Like, I don't know. I wasn't too involved in any of that type of stuff. My mom managed me for a while and dealed with sponsors and contracts and that I had no idea what basically what any of that was. Uh, I just knew I was happy for them to pay for my traveling and stuff. That was pretty awesome. Um, and then, you know, my mom got, she just felt like she wasn't a very, I don't know, just wasn't into it negotiating and doing this and that. And, uh, so yeah, I then got a manager and, and, you know, they did that type of stuff. And I, I feel like I was fortunate because I feel like the era or like around my like era, we got like the, ta I don't know. I feel like the, the, the sponsors were paying uh, guys like good money back then. And I felt like I'm very fortunate to like have gotten to have like grown up in that era. Like right now it seems like a tough time to be like a young kid and like trying to travel and do these contests. Cause it just seems like, uh, it just seems like a tough time. Yeah. I just, I just found the results. So 2008, you win the cold water classic over Chris Waring, Granger Larson and Sean Moody. Those are pretty young guys in the final, actually. <laughs> like when you think about it, like Chris and Granger wouldn't have been that old at the time either. Yeah. We were all probably like 
freshly out of NSSA right there. Yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty classic. I, I mean, yeah, it was fun. And you, for, for several years, if I remember this correctly, you rode for O'Neill, which, which is as synonymous with Santa Cruz as you are, right? So that's quite, that's quite the marriage. And then <laughs> you ended up as probably, I, I want to say, one of the early team riders on the, the very vaunted uh, Nike team, the 6.0 team. Yeah. Did, did, yeah. did switching from O'Neill to, to Nike 6.0 at the time, did it, did it feel like a huge shift for you? Or as you said, were you still kind of disconnected from it? And you're like, oh, just different sticker, put it on there and go do my job. No, it felt like a, definitely like a shift for me. Um, that was when like Nike was first getting into surfing and they were pretty involved with like the NSSA and the junior contests and I don't know. It was just like, it felt like to be a part of Nike was huge. And I, I was, couldn't believe that that opportunity came up and, um, that obviously to be on the same team as some of those guys with Kolohe and Julian and Kai Barger and the trips that they set up and the places I got to go by joining that team was obviously something I'd never trade. Like, you know, we had it so good back then. It was pretty crazy. Just some of the boat trips and all that stuff was pretty rad. Yeah. I mean, it, it felt like for you, um, you've, you've always been such an incredible athlete. Um, and, and surfing as an idea is an interesting one where it comes to like sport versus lifestyle versus, you know, are you a video surfer? Are you a free surfer? Are you a competitive surfer? Anytime I saw you in a video segment, I was blown away, but it was, it, Comparatively, it was pretty infrequent compared to some of your contemporaries, right? Where they were probably sure. working a lot on video parts versus yourself, who was, I, I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but maybe focusing more on competition. Is that something that was a conscious choice for you, but you back then? Um, not sure. It was like a, I definitely was more focused on competition than videos. Um, yeah, I don't know why I never really was it or like got into making edit or video parts in that um it's a lot it's a lot to like try to balance those two you know like for instance like i feel like julian did it pretty right he like made all you know he had all these parts and all these movies and made his movie before he really even like got started with the qs and then he like locked in on the qs qualified quickly and then like was just honed in on the ct like he had already like done all his video stuff basically before he even qualified it's a hard one to balance like competition and videos but for sure uh when i think before you get started on the qs and that it's probably seems like it makes sense to to work on video parts and improve in different areas of your surfing and and all that stuff i'm not sure why i i feel like i traveled a lot and went on a lot of trips i just don't know if i was involved in in many videos I'd imagine too that like, I mean, you were delivering like tangible results for your, your sponsors, which is really important. But also, as we pointed out, like you kind of the only guy doing that kind of surfing from Santa Cruz, you know, compared to somewhere like San Clemente. And, and I'm sure you representing that community for your sponsors meant a lot to your sponsors. And also at the same time, I'm sure the community, as we kind of pointed out at the, the Coldwater event, backed you almost singularly compared to i don't know like compare that to like you know cool and Gata or something where you know maybe there's eight guys on tour and it's like well who they who are they cheering for you can't cheer for all eight of them kind of thing yeah yeah no santa cruz shows me huge love and and i'm sure i mean anyone from here that's that's you know competing on like a world stage like they're fully behind and uh there's not many people from up here that you know, compete on at the highest level, but I don't know. Everyone definitely gets behind whether it's, you know, the 49ers or the warriors or the giants or, you know, and, and I'm fortunate to, to have the amount of support that I have from here and other places, you know, have this, have similar um, support for their people. And then, like you said, there's, there's places where they, they kind of breed pro surfers. So, maybe it waters it down a bit and they're just used to it. But mm. I know everyone's super excited because, you know, there hasn't been since I fell off tour, like 
they hadn't been anyone from Santa Cruz. And, and I know I, a lot of people have been telling me they're just excited to, to watch, uh, watch me on tour and stuff. So, um, I'm excited to try to, you know, bring back some, bring back a trophy or something to Santa Cruz for sure. You talked about how incredible some of those opportunities were riding for Nike. Um, and there was a lot of palace intrigue around that dynamic between Nike and Hurley, right? Because Nike purchased Hurley at some point in the Audis. Um, Hurley had a surf team, then Nike has a surf team. And and I think it was Jason Kenworthy and Zach Boone and, and maybe Frankie D'Andrea put together like yeah. this amazing team. And they did so like in an interesting way because I remember kind of hovering around that because they were looking at North American juniors and saying, oh, why don't we be your footwear sponsor? You know, we'll just sort of like remora fish, like nibble at this talented little (laughs) surfer here. And then when all you guys hit age, you know, like post juniors age, like 17, 18, 19, 20, they're like, okay, now we're going to be your primary sponsor. And everyone's like, oh my God, like, you know, the, the, the silverback gorillas come into the industry and look at them. And, and as you pointed out, they provided all those amazing opportunities. Now, I might get my years wrong here, but I want to say it was probably right before your rookie season where Nike ended up pushing their surf team 100% into the Hurley program, right? So all the Nike surfers then became Hurley surfers. Yeah. Hurley already had a really robust team. I think I got my timeline right because I want to say that in 2013 you were rocking Hurley stickers. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And you don't have to comment on this if you don't want to, but I have I I have always been fascinated um, by the story of the meeting in Hawaii with the teams <laughs> where the Nike team was informed that they'd now be riding for Hurley. Were you in the room when when you were yeah. w- with the the entire team? What were your thoughts when you were told this? Um, well, I think it kind of leaked online somewhere. Like <laughs> my mom was tell my mom was like telling me that like about it like a couple weeks before I went to Hawaii, but I just was like I didn't believe it. Mm. So I like had heard kind of some rumblings of it, but um, yeah, they sat us down in, in a house and and kind of explained what was going on and. Um, it was a shock for sure at the time. Um, I don't think anyone was expecting that, but obviously Hurley opened up or welcomed everyone with, with open arms. And so they were very supportive, of you know, at the time I, I think I was, that was my, my first year on tour. So I got to travel with like Brandon Gilmet yep. and like Mitch Ross and, and make, you know, pretty epic friendships with those guys. And, and we had some awesome times. So, um, I mean, I got to work with some awesome people at Nike, uh, Frankie and Kenworthy and Zach Boone and a guy, Curtis Graham. So yeah. it was pretty rad. And then got to work with some awesome people over at Hurley as well. Now, word on the street is that in that team meeting, not all the Nike team riders received the news that well. I'm not asking you to name names, but if you had to rank yourself on how well you received the news that you were going to go ride for Hurley on a one to 10 scale compared to everyone else in the room, where would you put yourself? 10 being perf- Dude, perfect. Citizen. I don't even remember. Honestly, I can barely remember. It was like, what is that? That's over 10 years ago now. I was shocked for sure because I just, I don't know. I wasn't expecting that. We were doing Nike was like, pouring a lot of money into surfing and we were doing all this cool stuff. So I wasn't expecting it, but I also had like friends that rode for Hurley at the time. And I think Evan Geiselman and Dumphy and, um, so I kind of knew what Hurley was about as well. So it wasn't like, it was a shock. It wasn't like the end of the world or anything. It was just, I don't know. Hurley was cool too. So it wasn't like, it was just something different. Yeah. And I, I, <laughs> my timeline right but i'm pretty sure that they combined the teams and then that's i want to say hawaii so that would have been december 2012 and then in those few months between then and the start of the season on the gold coast they also went and signed john john so like it was yeah. just like yeah i remember doing the numbers <laughs> when i was like getting the 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 schedule ready and i was like but here's the rankings list i'm like i'm pretty sure 
Hurley has a third of the CT field, like it's on the Hurley team. But uh, the reason I bring that up is because you perform so well your rookie year, you know? And, and I think maybe there were some flashier names just because the team was so large, but like you went and delivered and that must have, that must have felt pretty good. Yeah. I mean, you probably like have a little comp, you want to do well and, you know, have, make sure, or like get the support of your sponsor and have them like appreciate what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, that was a stack team for sure. Like, and they added John, John too. I think it was like John, John, Kolohe, Connor, Julian, you know, like Miguel Pupo, Michelle, Alejo. Like it was Felipe, crazy. Like, I'm looking at uh, Felipe. A- Ace. Who else? Ace, yeah, like Brett Sim- Simpo. Brett I think Simpo Simpo was, was on yeah. tour. <laughs> Yaden Nichols on tour. That was a cr- yeah. he- Alejo. That was a hectic team. That's crazy. It was probably a third of the CT. Yeah, it would have been for sure. That's how yeah. <laughs> funny. But it was also pretty cool to be, you know, like among those guys, like those are obviously some of the best surfers in the world. And to be, you know, among those guys and on the same team was pretty rad too. You get lost in there for sure. But yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you found a way to perform, which is really cool. I, I know I asked already, but uh, only child, brother, sisters. I think I'd... I have an older sister. Oh, cool. Awesome. Are you yeah. guys close or? Um, yeah. I mean, she lives in, um, St. John in the Caribbean, so I don't see her too often, but, um, so yeah, I have an older sister and she has a daughter, so I have a niece. Um, they're moving out here soon, which is pretty exciting for me. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. You know, you mentioned how instrumental your mom was to your entire career, but obviously your life, but did you feel a sense of accomplishment and a sense of pride because of your mom, when you qualified, did you feel like that was a validation of a lot of the the hard work that she put in for you? Yeah, I do. I think, you know, she poured so much like effort and, you know, I can't imagine how much money she spent to like be able to allow me to, to, to pull or to surf and to compete and all this stuff. So yeah, making the CT was definitely like a validation and like, Oh, we, we did it. Like we, you know, we, it wasn't for nothing. Like all the hard work paid off and, um, yeah, that, it was cool to, to, for me to have gotten there and my mom to see that. And, um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, it's tough for sure. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned, you know, the falling off a tour and, and the last few years coinciding with some really significant personal challenges and and you know we, we talked a little bit about you know your mom sadly passed away um almost a year ago i, I think early february 2021 yeah was, was, was her passing and 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 a, a potential like illness ahead of that something that that was that the primary thing that you're struggling with personally um well when I, the year I fell off tour, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. So that was a shock for me and like something that I didn't want to believe. And Mm. it was pretty hard to, you know, pack your bags and, and like travel for a few weeks and go to these contests and while your mom's back, you know, I, it's basically just me and my mom here in Santa Cruz. Like that's my sister lives in St. John, but that was the only family I have out here in Santa Cruz. And my mom has been like, you know, it's just been me and her. We've done everything together since I was born. So to go to the contest and, you know, she's going to chemo and, and all that stuff was, it. you know, it was like almost surfing wasn't very important at the time either. Like I just wanted to get through it and, you know, requalify or whatever I had to do to keep my spot. But like there was more important things going on in my life and, um, so that in itself was like pretty tough. And then she, she got through that and, and then, you know, last year, uh, she was diagnosed with cancer again. It, it came out of the blue and it wasn't something I was ready for. And, um, just the, all the, you know, everything that comes along with it and going to the 
hospital every day and all that stuff is seeing someone you love so much, you know, like in so much pain and struggling so hard. It's, it's really tough. And, um, I mean, that's much more than surfing and, and, um, you know, surfing didn't, didn't matter to me but at that time. It was just like, you know, what can I do to make sure this person I love so much is, you know, like, okay. And, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I wanted to be there for her every step of the way too, because she was there for me and I know she would be there for me if I was going through anything like that. So, um, you know, all that stuff's tough. It's really hard. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's tough to lose someone that you love so much. And, but at the same time, she, everything she did was for me to be able to, to live my dreams and surf and, and do what I love. So, coming back on tour, I almost feel like, you know, like I want to succeed for myself and her and, and, you know, finish this, all this out with, you know, on a positive note. It, it's hard. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, my, my dad, he passed away from cancer in um, 2020, um, I'm after sorry. seven years. Yeah. Well, and we, you know how it goes, but yeah, it, it's hard it's hard when everything is so intertwined, right? Where your mom was so instrumental to your career and I'm sure she would have wanted you to, to like, no, don't, don't worry about me, go out and requalify, you know, go, yeah. go do your thing. And as you pointed out, it's like it, it surfing professionally and, and, you know, a, a loved one, you know, suffering from an illness couldn't be further apart, like experientially. Right. And so it's like, yeah, you could be on the other side of the world going like, what am I doing? I need to be back there. But that person wants you to be living your life because that's what they work towards. Yeah. And then you mix everything of, you know, COVID and, and all the kind of logistics and operations that go into all that. It's just, I, I, I feel for you, man. Um, because it's, that's not an easy thing. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's never easy. And, uh, you know, it's just something that we're all going to go through. Like, you know, we're all going to have to deal with this at some point of our lives. And, you know, there's some people that deal with it better than others. And I, I mean, I look at Mick Fanning and all that he's gone through and same with Ryan Callan. I'm like, those guys are huge inspirations for me because, you know, all that they've gone through and, and they're able to, you know, like still kind of get the job done with, you know, in surfing and just like what Mick did at pipe, like that was pretty crazy. Like, you know, to like regain your focus and like put that aside for like that short period of time and like accomplish those things. It's, it's, uh, it's very impressive. So I, I look up to those guys and, you know, the, being able to like rebound from that type of stuff is inspiring. You know, as hard as it is to go through that, like it, it, there is beautiful poetry in the sense that, you know, after her passing, you did requalify, you know, and, and you've got this family that you get to compete for this year, but you also get to compete for your mom and everything that she, she put into your life. I think that's, that's really special, you know? Yeah. No, it's super, it, you know, it's definitely a different type of, of motivation. And at the same time, it's just like, I just want to like fully enjoy it. You know, I like at my first time on tour, I was like, I was just like, I don't know. I, I don't think I like fully was enjoying everything I was doing. It was just like almost like clockwork, just like go to these events and like, but at this stage, it's like after COVID and everything that, that has gone on in my life, it's like, you know, I'm so fortunate to like get to travel, go to these cool places and like surf, you know, the best waves in the world and, uh, and get to compete and, and get paid to do that. It's, it's pretty amazing. So definitely fortunate. And I, you know, it's, it's a different perspective these days, um, you know, coming back on tour than like I was when I was younger, for sure. Of course. Well, we're going to get to a couple more topics and we've got some listener questions for you, but we're going to take one more break to get a word in from our sponsors and we'll be right back. All right. So on January 29th, the 2022 WSL Championship Tour season starts with the Billabong Pro Pipeline uh, at the Bonsai Pipeline. 
We're backing that up with the Hurley event at Sunset Beach. You're in Santa Cruz today. What is your plan for heading out to Hawaii? Um, I'm heading out on Thursday, so a week from today. Um, and then I get there about two weeks before the pipe contest starts. And once I get there, it's just basically lock in and focus for these contests and, you know, figure out my boards, um, surf the waves that, it, that I'm going to be competing at and just get in as much practice as I can. Um, are you bringing the family over or are you, are you going Han Solo? On yeah. This one? Yeah. The family's going to come over here or come over to pipe with me. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that'll be cool. It'll be pretty rad. Uh, our, to have Rocky out in Hawaii in some warm weather. It's been, it's been so cold here. So <laughs> yeah. go to the beach. She hasn't touched the ocean. So that'll be cool. And different vibe for you probably than, than it has been for, for most of your career, right? Because it's probably not team houses you're staying at. You're probably organizing your own stuff. Is that, is that fair? Are you, is, is it, is it a departure from how it used to be for you? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely a lot different now. It's like, you know, I had it good back then. It was just like show up and you're taken care of. You got a house on the beach and walk down, walk out in front and surf whenever you want. But yeah, uh, it's, it's different these days for sure. Um, but it's all this, I mean, I'm going to the same place and surfing in the same contest. So it's just a place to stay. And you're not completely without sponsors. You know, you're running Buell Wetsuits. They're out of Santa Cruz. You've got Pacific Wave Surf Shop. You've got Creatures of Leisures. Um, and you were at Channel Island Surfboards. Is that, does that cover the sponsorship for 2022 and so far? Rakuten. Excuse me. Uh, they, they, they stepped up and helped me out. So it's pretty cool. That's very they sponsor cool. Sponsor the Warriors. So it's pretty rad. That's amazing. Yeah, it's cool. Buell and Pacific Wave are both local companies here from Santa Cruz. So it's like, it's come full circle and um, it's fun to represent, you know, companies that believe in you and work with people that you've known your whole life and that actually care about you and want to see you succeed. So it's, it's rad. Totally. And you were one of the primary Channel Islands team riders for several years and then did what so many CI goofy footers tend to do, go, go surf for DH for a little bit, come back, you know, <laughs> I'm not joking. But I think that... That could, I could say that that has to do with the overthinking everything uh, category. That falls into the overthinking everything category. That was like the switch up everything you know. You know, it's like right. blame it on this, blame it on that. You know, that's what it was. It was just like blame it on my boards or, you know, not, to, not own that it was my fault. And so those guys, I'm happy to be back with those guys and, um, they're awesome. I've, you know, I was with them when I was like 17. So, um, I'm thankful and they're here in California, which is rad. Yeah. And I mean, they're, I'm pretty close to them as well. And, and I don't think this is me going off reservation. They need you, you know, like the, their, their team is in rebuilding phase and you're, you're really one of the primary hitters on tour for them now. Yeah. I get to work with, uh, Mike Andrews who I've, you know, worked with since I was a young kid and who's always made me, you know, plenty of good boards. So I'm excited. And, um, yeah, I got a, a lot of them to try out when I get to Hawaii, I'm get, getting them all right before I go. So, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the problem. That was the, like, you know, a hard thing with like Haleiwa just ending was like, you, you got to get all these boards like right before pipe. And so I haven't really had any time to try them. So that's, that'll be, you know, goal number one when I get to Hawaii. Now we talked about there's back-to-back -back championship tour events in Hawaii, Pipeline, Sunset Beach, two radically different waves. When you were preparing for the start of the season in those two weeks that you're over there, are you splitting your time between the venues or are you just, I'm 100% focused on Pipe and then when that event's over, I will switch my focus to Sunset or are you splitting your time? How, how, are you, how do you think you're going to go about it? I think splitting your time is probably a good method. Um, I can't imagine pipe's going to be good every day for all those two weeks. So probably, you know, I probably will only surf those two waves up until the contest. So, but sunset's so tricky that you need to spend a lot of time out there. Right. And you know, those days that pipe's pretty good, I'll, I'll surf. And those little days of backdoor, definitely I need to, to practice on. And, and so a good split between the two, because you don't want to just surf pipe 
practice that and then like go to sunset without any warm ups and and sunset's so tricky. Yeah. Pound for pound, the most dangerous wave in the world pipeline. Do you feel comfortable out there at, at 30 years old? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've stayed at those team houses since I was like 15 years old and surfed out there a lot. So I'm, I feel comfortable. Um, yeah. I'm, it's one of the best waves in the world. So I'm excited. I love, I don't know. I love that wave. Did I'm going to, I'm going to drill into this a little bit out of my own personal curiosity, but did being over there at 15 and staying in those team houses and watching it, were you immediately comfortable just going back to kind of the like, Oh, I'm confident I'm young. Like what, what do I have to be worried about? Or, or was it something you had to work towards? And was, was there kind of a transition phase where you're like, you know what? I'm, I'm no longer scared out here. I know what I'm doing. I know where to sit. I know which waves to take. No, I was definitely not immediately comfortable. I'm not saying I'm like, I don't even know if I'm like totally comfortable. I'm, I'm not, I'm not totally comfortable out there right now. Mm. Like I still get scared when I go out there and when I start, you know, like I'm definitely still scared at pipe, but I'm willing to, you know, you know, overcome those fears. And, and that's kind of when you catch the best waves of your life is like, you're definitely, you if you're if you're totally comfortable you're probably not going to catch the best wave of your life but like when you're you know nervous and you're stepping out of your comfort zone that's when like you know you get those waves and you overcome those fears so i'm not saying i'm like completely 100 percent comfortable but i do think in those competitions like your fear kind of you push that to the side and you're just like all in on what it takes to make those heats yeah as far as your quiver goes between these two hawaiian venues do you surf pipe boards at Sunset Beach or vice versa? Are they different boards? Like, like how do you kind of go about that? I just ordered um, just different size boards that are all the same. So um, hopefully they work it both. I'm, yeah, don't want to overthink it too much. So I'm just going <laughs> to um, hope that they both work or that they work. I mean, pipe, you're just, you're not, you're just going straight in the barrel and um, Sunset, you're doing some turns. So yeah see if they work when I get there. <laughs> and just general, <laughs> oh, I'll move off the boards in a second, but I, this is one of my favorite questions for CT surfers because they tend to fall into two broad camps. Um, they're the CT surfers who are like, yeah, I don't mind riding epoxies or fishes or whatever. Like I ride whatever I want to ride. And in a contest, I'll ride whatever I need to ride. Yeah, That's one camp. The other camp is like, nope. I don't care if it's half a foot onshore slop. I'm riding my Ferrari because I need to be as sharp as possible on this board at all times. Which camp would you say you fall into? The second of the two, a hundred percent. I can't remember the last time I rode like a, a fun board or a fish or any, I don't even know if I own one. I'm just like strictly like dial in my boards. Does it work in this condition? Does it work best? You know, like if it doesn't, then onto the next one. It's just like, I feel like it's just like a constant, like, it's like a checklist for me, you know, it's like, it's like being, it comes down to being as prepared as possible, but I admire those guys that, you know, like jump out and do a heat on like a brand new board or something like that. Oh, like right. they just, <laughs> that's like something I could never do. It's just like, I need to, to be like 100% confident in my decision, but yeah, <laughs> I wish I could be like the other way around. <laughs> yeah I, that's the ocd uh, of course yeah well it never goes away you just have to no. you just manage it right every part of life yeah i uh <laughs> i i mentioned that that I, i've always been a fan of your surfing um and i don't say that about everyone but i think you know in 2022 now excuse me you're surfing uh better than ever and that's my opinion but i'm nobody what is your self-assessment do you feel like you're surfing the best you've ever surfed um I don't know. That's a good question. I feel like I feel, I don't know. That's, I, I feel like I don't get to see a ton of footage of myself, so I don't really know. Um, I definitely go out and have shockers and feel like I'm surfing. I'm like trying to like piece it back together, but then someone will tell me that I like looked like I was surfing good. So like the other day I thought I was kind of having a shocker and someone said that that it, uh, the board looked really good. And I was like, Oh, that's good. But, <laughs> um, yeah, 
I feel like I, yeah, I haven't forgotten how to surf. I don't know. <laughs> of course. But I guess com- compare, compare, maybe this is a fair question. Like when you qualified for your rookie season, so 2013, the way you surf then to the way you surf now in 2022, have things changed? Um, do you do things better? Do you do things maybe not as much? I don't know. Like, do, do you feel like your surfing's changed in that window of time? Yeah, I would say I've, I would hope I've improved. I mean, I would hope I haven't gotten worse or stayed the same. So I think hopefully I've improved. Um, but I think also just the getting out of my own way and, and just like reacting off instincts and just kind of doing what I've, you know, just like not thinking, thinking about it and just surfing the way I know how to surf. Um, I'm confident with that. And, um, so yeah, I, I, I do think I've improved for sure. Yeah. Looking at the 2022 championship tour, the first five events, pipe, sunset beach, super tubos, bells beach, main break, Margaret river. Nothing's guaranteed because there's a mid season cut. Which of the first five stops are you most looking forward to competing at? I mean, pipe for sure. It's the first contest, first CT of, I don't know how long it's been, to be honest with you. Everyone tells me how long it's been. Someone said it was like four years. Someone said six years. I don't know what it was. I don't really know. But the first contest, yeah, it's just the first CT I've been in in a long time. I'm excited for. I'm really excited to like be surfing a heat where you're trying to get barreled. That sounds pretty fun. It's been a long, can't remember the last time I did that. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. And after, because this is probably a fait accompli, you make the mid-season cut. We have G-Land, uh, Trestles, I'm going to screw this up, Sakurama, J-Bay, Chopu. Which of those are you most looking forward to competing at? It would probably have to be G-Land and Chopu. It's funny because like, m- my strengths, obviously, like right point breaks and, and growing up here in Santa Cruz, you know, surfing on my backhand. But like... I'll do, I'll go out of my way to find a worse little left or, you know, those, I just have fun getting barreled surfing lefts and stuff. So I look forward to those for sure. Um, I've never really done good at, at Chopur, so that would be pretty rad, but I look forward to those ones. And I mean, I look forward to the other ones too, but I don't know, those left barrels, like, uh, how could you not get excited for those as a goofy foot? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. The, um, <laughs> you know, the rookie class, or I, I won't say rookie necessarily, but the challenger series class that you qualified alongside included, um, Ezekiel Lau, Liam O'Brien, Connor O'Leary, Jake Marshall, Kalem Robson, Samuel Pupo, Imai Kalani Devault, Luca Messinas, Zhao Shianka, Jackson Baker, Carlos Munoz, quite quite an eclectic group uh, of surfers um how do you feel about the challenger series that you just competed on and the surfers that it's produced to the championship tour compared to maybe other kind of classes that have qualified through the qs i think it's pretty cool there's like a, you know a lot of new name there's some some guys that have been on tour uh and have fallen off there's a lot of new names that kind of made a name for themselves this year that are a bit unknown, I would say, like not that some people don't know and probably haven't seen surf too often. And then there's some young, like really good up and coming young guys that, that kind of broke through this year. It's, it's exciting to see a lot of new faces for sure. Um, sometimes there's years where it's a lot of guys that had like fallen off on the previous year that requalify. So I think that it's pretty exciting when you get like a crop of guys that um, you know, everyone's excited to see. I've had a lot of people say like, this is a pretty cool group of guys are excited to see because it's just a lot of variety, a lot of different like countries represented it represented. And yeah, it's going to be cool. I like it. What do you think? I don't know if I'm on the record as saying this. I could be because I've said it so much, but I've been saying, I'm trying to think of how they've done since I've been saying it, but you know, it's one of those things where someone came up to me and they're like, you know, there's no Jordy Smith and there's no like 
Gabriel Medina. And there's no like one superstar that qualifies that's qualified through the system. And my my counter to them was like, well, the, those surfers that tend to get a lot of hype um, from the QS before they get onto the CT um, take a while because the speed and the, the performance level at the CT is just so much higher than anyone kind of gives it credit for. And then secondarily, you know, when those surfers qualify, that the whole class doesn't do as well. But I kind of compared the men's Challenger Series class to the 2021 New England Patriots, where it's like there's not like one mega superstar, but they're all really good. And and collectively, I feel like everyone's going to be making inroads. Um, so that was my take. I don't know if it's still accurate from a football perspective, but yeah, I'll, I'll run with that. Yeah. I mean, I think like last year watching Emi surf was like, he did some very impressive surfing that like if people, you know, I'm not sure if everyone tunes into the QSs, but he did some surfing that could be, if he does it next year, like people are going to, you know, be pretty shocked to see the way he surfs for sure. Well, and it's just interesting the way that the CT is structured now, right? Because those first five events are pretty like critical waves, you know, like you've got pipe that it might be in a, a, significantly better season for swell like you might be getting proper pipe swells compared to maybe a lot of sand on the reef maybe more back door um sunset beach critical wave super tubos in march as opposed to october which reportedly again is like primary swell and wind window um and then bells and margaret river so there's not you know they're all pretty like serious waves that favor like power surfing and and like like kind of kind of core surfing in a lot of ways so it'll be interesting to see how everyone kind of fares and obviously the stakes are really high especially if you're coming off the challenger series because you're at the back of the rankings you're going to be drawing top seeds and for some of the surfers that haven't competed at those venues but present company excluded of course it might be it might be a really steep learning curve because you're coming up against sort of alpha predators at waves of consequence and if you don't perform in those first five events, like you're back on the challenger series. Yeah, totally. With that mid-year cut, like it, it makes it tough on, um, on the bat or like on the, yeah, the, the low seeds for sure. Like they're going to come up against the highest seeds. I, I like the way that the format is like you get, you know, two shots to get through into the, to the third round mm. and your odds are, you know, decent as if you can put together a heat, but yeah, it's it's gonna be tricky for sure. Like trying to come on the CT, never having been on the CT, and surf against those top seeds at waves that like are a whole lot different than what the QSs are holding or held in. It's also a different strategy. It's such a different strategy. Like a man on it's you know it's man on man. So it's like like I think it's less luck comes involved is involved in a man on man heat. Yeah, and I'm mean, good. The consistency, I think, maybe from when you started the first time around is the same, though, right? It's still about levels. You know, you're coming in as a rookie, you're coming in off the Challenger Series, and it's like, well, the goal is I have to make inroads into the top 22 before the, the midseason cut. Like, that's level one or level two. Right. You know, and then from there, it's like, now I want to be top 10. Now I want to be top five. Now I'm in the title hunt. Like, I'm at the WSL yeah. finals. And so it, it'll it be interesting to see. I, I do – I am interested – this will be my last question then we'll go to the Instagram community but once you make the mid-season cut you are guaranteed your qualification for the start of 2023 do you think for you personally that's just going to change the way you approach events where you're like I'm good for 2023 it's not about surviving anymore it's just about winning or do you think it's like nope I'm just going to approach I'm approaching pipe competition the same way I'm going to approach G land it doesn't make a difference to me um, I mean, it definitely like relieves like the, you have like nothing to lose in that back half of the year. Like you've already secured your spot. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Mm. Um, I'm not sure that's the right way to look at it. I think you probably should just look at it. Like every contest should be the same. It's just go out there and with your strategy and try to win, try to win. But, um, you know, those, you know, when you have that pressure of falling off tour and, and being sent back down, like, I think it's harder to make, like, you're a bit more in your head, you're a bit more frantic, you may, might make the, like, 
decisions you might not normally make when you're thinking clearly and and, and you're calm and and so I, I do think it's a bit different that back half of the year I think uh, everyone could should be a bit more relaxed makes sense but I do I'm, I'm excited for the because I think a lot of the guys on tour you know the new guys that just qualified they've got nothing to lose they're gonna you know come up against these high seeds and and give it to them for sure so mm. i think it'll be exciting me too well we put out a feeler to the instagram community and we got dozens of questions back but we whittled it down to, to three um so the first question is from at ab underscore muv who asks where is your favorite place to surf in the bay area presuming you could name the spot um Hendo can bleep it out if it's if we have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean there's a lot of good ways here. Like I'm lucky I get to surf a lot of really good waves. But honestly, I like surfing the waves that I like grew up surfing as a kid. Like there's this little wave at the pier here in Santa Cruz that like only breaks when it's like really stormy and it's like probably looks like the East Coast, but like I don't know why it just like brings back memories and I like I love surfing it. It doesn't break very often. So like it's a treat when it breaks, but like it's not, it's definitely not a world-class wave or anything like that. But like, I don't know. I just like, I'd be bummed if I like missed a session there. <laughs> There's some other world-class waves around here that I'm not going to name, but, but, um, I don't know. I, I still really do enjoy the waves that I like grew up surfing. I like that. Second question is from at Oscar Mayher who asks, what's been your favorite and least favorite part of the challenger series? Um, my favorite part of doing of the challenger series was I feel like 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 I was traveling with like a group of Americans that are all like some of my good friends. I was traveling with like Michael Dunphy, Evan Geiselman, Ian Crane, Cam Richards, and Sebastian Zietz and like the Godowskis brothers. Like it's super fun. Like you know, like a good group of us like hanging out, traveling together, staying together. It's always like fun and like always laughs and it makes you know outside of surfing a lot of fun um so that was probably my that's my favorite part about about it and what was the other part my least favorite part yeah what was your least favorite part uh my least favorite part would be probably uh some of the waves that we surfed and maybe four man heats i don't know i don't like four man heats very much <laughs> it's there all right, last question from the Instagram community is from at Andy Cashford, who asks, as a vet, do you ever feel overwhelmed by particular matchups in competition? Um, I don't think so. I think, like, I used to be pretty, like, I'd look at the draw and, you know, you'd, like, see who you might get or, who, you know, that type of stuff. But I feel like at this point it's just, like, I just want to focus on what I can do, uh, focus on, you know, putting myself in the best positions and trying to execute and kind of whatever happens, happens. Um, I feel like that's the stage I'm at now. And, you know, regardless of that's like a Gabriel Medina or someone else, like you just give your, yourself the best shot to win. And if you win, then you win. And if you don't, then you don't and just go out and surf good and, be happy with how you performed. I like it. I'm going to add an audible on the, the community question since you're a Niners fan. In two years' time, assuming they're both healthy, who do you want quarterbacking the San Francisco 49ers, Jimmy Garoppolo or Trey Lance? Um, well, I think it's clear that Jim, that it's going to be Trey Lance. I mean, it's pretty. it was pretty obvious this year for the draft with how much they gave up. So I would say I would put my money on Trey Lance, but um, yeah, that's who I'd put my money on. Okay, I appreciate, I appreciate that answer. <laughs> All right, we got one more segment. It's time for the lightning round presented by Michelob Ultra Pure Gold. These are 10 questions for you to answer as quickly as you can. All right. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad, bonzer, or finless, which would you choose? Thruster. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Burrito or pizza? Ooh, that's a tough one. Burrito. Well, Mexican food. Last book you read? The Power of Now. 
best surf film ever? Um, campaign, drive through, maybe campaign. I'd probably go campaign. One wave you never have to go back to. Uh, that I don't want to go back to. Sure. I don't know. That's a weird question. Maybe I won't miss the waves in Virginia Beach, but I like the place. <laughs> it's just a diplomatic answer. If you only get to surf one wave for the rest of your life. Cloud break. Best person to share a lineup with. Your best friend. I don't know. Probably on tour would be Kolohe. Worst person to share a lineup with. Uh, I'm not going to. Not gonna say that one, <laughs> but you have an answer, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know who it is, but I'm sure I wouldn't want to surf somewhere with some people. Yeah, there's candidates, I'm sure. Okay, last one. Finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. By. Um, just. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to base my happiness off of others. Of, of other things, just, you know, enjoying my day to day life and kind of what comes along with it. Definitely not going to base my happiness off of things that I can't control. It's a great answer. Nat Young, thank you for coming on the lineup. A huge congratulations on fatherhood and uh, also big congratulations on requalifying for the elite WSL championship tour. Can't wait to see you at the opening stop at the Billabong Pro Pipeline. Thanks for talking to us, man. Yeah, thank you, Dave. And um, yeah, I will see you right here in a week or two. Sounds good, man. Looking forward to it. Stay safe.